Uh, thank you, James, for giving us a short announcement. Today, uh, we're going to continue with our series, and there are some questions I want you to do together, all right? Uh, there will be some riddle to solve, okay? All right, so it's coming up, all right? Um, so, uh, uh, the Apostles' Creed, uh, we are talking about this ancient uh, statement of faith. Uh, it's been around for uh, more than 1,500 years, almost 2,000 years, uh, to give us a world map of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Um, we are uh, coming to, I don't know, uh, statement number one, two, three, four, maybe four or five. Uh, it talks about Jesus. Remember, the center of the entire Apostles' Creed is on Jesus Christ himself, what he has done and who he is. So right here, we have a statement that uh, he was crucified, he died, and was buried, and he descended to the dead. That means he really died, right? Was crucified. All right, that is a technical phrase in the first century. Now, who is being crucified in the first century? Political criminals. They will be crucified. In fact, Jesus was not the only one being crucified uh, in the first century. Um, I think, um, as I prepared this message, I remember it was back in the 1970s. Yeah, 70s. Um, before you were born, right? Wait, I was born. Okay, I was born. Um, there in Jerusalem, they uh, dug out a tomb, and in the tomb, they found uh, some human bones. Uh, one of the uh, bone pieces is um, uh, a heel bone of a man. All right, heel bone of a man. Uh, you can see on the left, uh, there is still a Roman nail uh, going through it. Um, we guess that maybe in somebody being crucified, uh, that man being crucified, the victim of crucifixion, and he was buried, and then uh, as they uh, try to bury him, uh, because there was a big nail going through his heel bone. You know where the heel bone is? Yeah? Going through it, professionally, going through the entire heel bone without breaking it. Um, and then when they buried the guy, uh, they could not take uh, the nail out. Uh, probably because uh, the, the, the nail was bent or something like that. So as you can see from this heel bone, you can reconstruct kind of what it would look like uh, for a crucifix uh, victim. So two, two uh, both of the feet are being nailed to the, uh, to the vertical wood, be wood beam. And then uh, hands and arms uh, extended. Uh, usually, good, the nail will go through uh, your wrist. Um, so this reconstruction does not show it. However, uh, sometimes uh, a, a crucifix victim uh, would be uh, nailed to the cross uh, by four nails, uh, just like what the gospel uh, have described. All right, the nailed hand, right, both hands, and then uh, nailed feet, right. Um, so this is something historical. Uh, we are looking at what's crucified, this phrase. Only the political uh, criminals, uh, political rebels, they were being hunted down by the Roman authorities, the Roman Empire police, uh, and then they would crucify uh, these people. Now, as, as mentioned, uh, crucifixion is a political uh, penalty for all those who have committed treason against the Roman Empire. Now, with this picture, we can see that actually Jesus died on the cross. He, uh, uh, he let us see there was a political side to the kingdom of God. By dying on the cross, by suffering from crucifixion, He's actually showing us there is a different reality, different kingdom, different political reality. Um, and we as Christ followers, we have to see that. Uh, just happened today is the Happy Independence Day, uh, well, tomorrow, right? Uh, the Happy July 4th uh, weekend. 
Many Americans are celebrating nationalism, right? Patriotism. Uh, there's nothing wrong with loving our country, but that can never trump our allegiance to the kingdom of God. Because followers of Jesus Christ, we are proclaiming a totally different reality. And Jesus, by dying on the cross, he proclaims a totally different world order, a totally different order of power, reconfiguring our whole life. When Jesus came to your life, when Jesus came to my life, there should be some reconfiguration of powers, reconfiguration of functions uh, in our lives. Jesus died on the cross. He sacrificed himself. He laid down his own right. That is a different reality, isn't it? Right? Crucifixion. Jesus died on the cross. It's other center. He died on the cross so that we can be saved. He did not grasp his own right in heaven, but he laid down his own right. That's why the Bible consistently emphasized one fact, is that Jesus is the servant king. And that is the status for all church communities. We follow Jesus, we profess his faith, we believe in him. As the Apostles' Creed says, we believe that he was crucified, he died. And that is the example of Jesus. Let me read uh, a passage from uh, Philippians 2. It says, your attitude, your mindset, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And then he goes on, uh, Jesus being in the nature of God, very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grabs, but made himself nothing. Those of us who are versed in English grammar, you should know something called reflexive pronoun. You know what reflexive pronoun is? No? Those who are teachers, students. <laughs> reflexive pronoun means something that you do to yourself, right? Something that you do to yourself. That is reflexive pronoun. Can you find a re reflexive pronoun here? Made himself nothing. Nobody forced him to do that. But he chose to do that. He made himself nothing. This is the example of Jesus. And, and, and we have to ask one more question. Why did Paul write 2.5, right? Philippians. There was something be, before 2.5, which is 2.1-4, right? Actually, Paul is actually teaching the Christians in Philippi. The small group churches, maybe 5, 10 people a group. Uh, 10, 15 people is called a church community uh, in the city of Philippi. And he is trying to teach them what it means to live as a church, what it means to be the church. And church is a community where we lay aside our own interest. We come into the church, we gather with our, with a Bible study group or a college Bible study group or a high school group or coming to worship. No matter what, where, where we gather, if we gather in the name of Christ, if we gather in the name of Jesus, first presupposition is to lay down your own right, your own priority, your own interest. Working for the interests of others, that is the community of church. That is what Christ has called us to be. Now, many people today, when we come to church, uh, sometimes we forgot to check our attitude. We come here to be entertained, right? Have you ever noticed the worship team played some wrong notes? Probably they did, right? You walk out the church and would you give five star to the worship experience? Probably not, right? <laughs> Probably not. But if we do that, if we do that, we miss the whole point. We are not experiencing the presence of God. We are not experiencing the presence of Jesus. We come here not as a customer. We come here as a community of Jesus Christ himself. And what did he do? He laid down his own rights. He made himself nothing. 
That is the church. That is what the church is all about. Uh, one more example. Uh, we can quote other passages from the Bible talking about the church being a different order from the world, totally different from our culture, because the culture, there is a culture, culture script out there, the American culture. Happy July 4th, we celebrate individualism. That is the meta narrative of our culture, of our world. And it's con constantly, you know, brainwashing us to tell you that if you follow this meta narrative, this big narrative, this cultural script, you will be great. You define yourself by individualistic choices, right? I make my own choices. I want to define myself uh, the way I want, I want to. That is the meta narrative out there. But when we come before Christ, it's a totally different ballgame, isn't it? We lay down our own rights. It's no longer individualism. It is other center community. We lay down our own rights. We lay down our own uh, 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 status. I think of uh, some other passages from the Bible that also uh, uh, proclaims this, this kind of dif different uh, order of power. Uh, remember that there were some passages in the Bible in the New Testament, we, it sounds funny to us as modern readers. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of the examples is uh, 1 Timothy 2. Paul there is teaching the women in the church not to dress up to go to church, but to dress down. Have you ever noticed that? No jewelry. Paul is saying, you know, don't come here with nice clothing. I see that you are not coming with very nice clothing. That's good, all right? <laughs> and why did Paul do that? <laughs> why did Paul do that? Uh, you think your clothing is nice? <laughs> well, anyways. <laughs> well, you know, uh, oh, you picked that this morning? Cool. <laughs> anyways, First Timothy 2, if you have time, go back home and, you know, read that passage. Paul is actually doing something very funny to us, right? He said, don't dress up when you come to church. You dress down. Now the question is, why, right? Because in the Roman Empire, the social order so often is defined by what you wear, right? Now it's funny to us because we no longer do that, right? We, we no longer emphasize so much on this, right? I'm a CEO of a big company. They can give a, you know, a presentation, a formal presentation with jeans, right? I mean, we don't do that anymore, do we? We don't. I remember, I remember in the old days, in the 80s, in the 90s, when we go to church, sometimes we are required to put on certain tie. Well, an unspoken rule. Um, I remember one time uh, we were still in college. Uh, we were going with some friends to... Uh, Los Angeles. So we were driving down from uh, Northern California. I was in Sacramento at that point. Uh, and then we drove down to Los Angeles uh, for vacation. So some of our friends, uh, we went to Hollywood, we went to um, Universal Studio and all, all those stuff, right? The, the fun stuff. Um, so on Sunday, we found a church. Um, see, we're good, good Christians, right? We, we still find a church to go to. Uh, so Sunday morning, we drove to uh, one of the churches uh, in, in, in the area. Um, so we walked into the church, right? Um, so we were young and fun people. Um, I, I remember one of my friends was wearing short. And he, we, as a group, we walked into the church. And then we were stopped by a deacon. And the deacon stopped us, but not stopped me because I was wearing pants, right? long pants, stopped the guy wearing shorts and started yelling at him that you don't come to the sanctuary with shorts. I mean, is that crazy? That's kind of crazy, right? That's kind of crazy. I still remember some of the churches uh, back in uh, my generation, uh, they have ties um, uh, at the door. And whenever, whenever they pick, they, they find a guy without wearing a tie, 
You can borrow a tie, don't worry. You can borrow a tie and tie, tie it around your neck, and you come to the holy sanctuary to worship God, right? Do you want to do that? No, right? <laughs> no, I find it funny. I find it funny. Uh, now I've, I've grown uh, uh, after all these years. And I, I, I find it funny because the New Testament actually tells us to dress down. In the Roman order of things, you dress up to focus on your social status, right? That's why the wealthy woman will dress up when they go to church. And when they dress up to go to church, they will emphasize their own high status in the society so that other poor people also come to the church. Then there is a contrast, right? Now, Paul is, uh, Paul is not trying to censor their clothing or what they wear. Paul is trying to say in the community of the church, we don't emphasize our social economic differences because the ground around the cross is level. At the foot of the cross, we are all sinners and we are only justified by grace. And that's the spirit, right? That is what the church means. We come as a community to focus on others, not ourselves. Great example, right? Um, if you take a look at the previous context of 2.5, you know, the hymn for Christ, how he made himself nothing, how he uh, uh, died on the cross as a slave. Paul was actually teaching the Christians how to be together, how to form a community together. He said, if you have any encouragement from being uh, united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy, a process, complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Jesus was crucified and died as a political victim. That is the example of servanthood. We follow Jesus, we do the same. Now the Apostles' Creed continue with the phrase, under Pontius Pilate. You know who that guy is? Pontius Pilate? Pontius Pilate. Now, under the Roman occupation at the time, uh, Rome will send a local governor, a Roman, to rule over uh, conquer cities like Palestine, the land of Israel at that time in the first century. Um, so the Roman governor would rule over the Jewish people. And of course, the Jewish people would hate the governor. So there is a huge uh, political disconnection there. There's a huge political tension between Pontius Pilate, who ruled Palestine at the time, AD 26 to 36, um, against the, the, the Roman uh, population. Uh, there was story after story outside the Bible talking about people rebelling against the authorities, uh, protesting, and all that stuff. And Pilate, uh, was a crafty polit politician. Remember the Jewish authorities trying to persecute Jesus and crucify him and crucify him, they yell. Um, and then they bring Jesus to uh, Pilate, the, the, the governor, because as local authorities, the Jerusalemites, they could not impose a death penalty. So they bring him to Pilate. Um, as the Roman governor at the time, um, Pilate wanted to keep the peace to please the people. That's why he had Jesus crucified. So Pilate was a crafty politician. It's like today, right? You hear about who you should vote for. Someone's going to uh, try to, to win your vote, right? Uh, don't get into the trap because they are all politicians, right? They're all politicians. 
No political party can represent the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is so big, bigger than left or right or center. A different reality, different order of things. Now here's the riddle. Uh, as we talk about the Apostles' Creed, under Pontius Pilate. That's very interesting because there's a bad guy in this uh, Apostles' Creed, right? It's supposed to be a, some, something, something really pure, right? Document, talking about the Christian faith. Why, they, why did they put uh, uh, Pontius Pilate there, right? A bad politician there. Um, well, this is a historical note, right? Christianity is historic. Something that happened in real time and space, right? It's not some mythic stories. It's not some fictional stuff that we believe in, but something that actually happened in real time and space. Pontius Pilate, governor of Palestine, AD 26 to 36, right? If you check the uh, Roman history or the history of the uh, Eastern uh, Mediterranean uh, area, you would find this name show up on other different uh, historical documents. Now, many years ago, there was a city in the land of Palestine uh, called Caesarea, Caesarea Militima. Uh, it's a harbor. It's a huge man-made harbor. Uh, people were digging there, and they found a piece of stone being reused later time in a Roman theater. And on that stone, there were some inscriptions. Now, the riddle is, can you find the name Pilate on the inscription? Can you find it? Can you make it out? Where is it? Can you find P-I-L-A-T-U-S or V-S? Can you find it? Where is it? <laughs> well, first line says Tiberium, right? Tiberius was also the Roman emperor at the time, Tiberius. So there was a Tiberium, some sort of temple dedicated to the boss, right? The CEO of the entire Roman empire, right? Tiberium. So this kind of a dedication inscription uh, for a temple in Caesarea Miltima. Can you find Pilate? Can you see that? Yeah, Pontus Pilate, right? Pontus Pilate, and then prefect of Judea, right? Um, so Pi Pilate is a historical thing. It's a historical figure, right? When they unearth this thing, they finally find something in the stone that says Pilate was a real guy. Um, of course, Jesus was a real guy, right? As the creed says, he was crucified on the third day, and then he rose again, ascended into heaven, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. The empty tomb is being affirmed as an other historical fact. The tomb of Jesus is empty. Point blank telling you the tomb of Christ is empty. But how do you explain the em empty tomb? I want to close today's message with a pretty long quote. I find this book is one of the best books on uh, the reality of uh, the empty tomb. Uh, this guy is an Israeli archaeologist. Uh, his Israeli historian, Shimon Gibson. Now, I found this book pretty interesting because he's, um, you know, Gibson is not, uh, he's not a Christian, obviously. He's a he Israeli Jew. Uh, he's a historian, and he has, has written this pretty good book because this book begins with so, some sort of uh, presuppositions. The presupposition is that the four gospel Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are quite reliable documents. So he started to investigate what is being told by the four Gospels. Are they really eyewitnesses 
uh, are they win really uh, historical accounts reliable? We can trace back to uh, the time of Jesus. And then he's tried to unearth other stuff and to match the evidence. Toward the end, he says, there are different strange theories having been put forward to explain away the empty tomb. But Gibson said they are all based on nonsense. Archaeology and history cannot prove or dis disprove the possibility that Jesus' body was muggled out by persons unknown, but this is a matter of speculation. Now, here's the important point. The reality is there is no historical explanation for the empty tomb. Other than, now, if you, if you try to come up with different theories, different uh, ways to explain away the empty tomb, Gibson is saying there's no way you can do that because there's no historical scientific explanation for the empty tomb unless you adopt the biblical reason, the theological explanation, which says the resurrection. And he says, I leave it up to the reader to make up your mind. I find this very interesting conclusion, right? You can do historical inquiry of why the tomb is empty. Somebody stole the, uh, the body or maybe the, the disciple went to a wrong tomb or something like that, right? You can explain away the empty tomb, but, you know, ultimately, there's no historical scientific ways to explain why the tomb was empty. There's no way. Because that goes beyond historical inquiry. That goes beyond all scientific knowledge can tell you. At the end of the day, you can only conclude that the tomb is actually empty. But why? When you talk about the reason, there's only one reason given by the Bible. Whether you accept it or not, it's a theological reason that God raised Jesus from the dead, right? God raised Jesus from the dead. It's a miracle. It's something only God can do. Now, to accept that reason, you cannot stay in your own order of things. You cannot maintain your own worldview, so to speak. All right? You have to change your own worldview radically in order to accept that biblical theological reason that God did something to the body of Jesus, raised him from the dead. And that worldview transformation is to say that, okay, I don't maintain my own close universe, close system kind of worldview. Reality is not just, you know, here and now and something I can touch, right? I can sense. It's not just that. There's a reality higher than the order of things that I can see. And that is a supernatural, metaphysical reality. I think Gibson, I, I, I have to agree with uh, Simone Gibson. You have to make up your mind whether you accept the theological reason or not. Now, uh, I want to close today's message by uh, quoting this verse. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says, I have been crucified, the old self. Paul is talking about his old self. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, the new self. When you accept Jesus, there should be a fundamental change in our lives, our attitude, our worldview, our perspective on order of things. Christ lives in me. The life I live, the new life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. And he loved me and gave himself for me. This is no longer something out there, some objective fact or something that happened in the world in time and space. Yes, that's true. Historical fact and, you know, Pontius Pilate, Jesus, the real guy, and all that stuff, empty tomb. It becomes a subjective experience. It becomes your own personal experience. Christianity, 
biblical faith, it's all about relationship. It is your relationship with Christ. But please understand, this sort of relationship is not just, you know, you know patting my, my back and, you know, you'll be okay. It's a radical transformation, how we see the world and how we see ourselves. Well, I want to recite the Apostles' Creed together, and then we'll pray together. Let's all recite together. Shall we all stand? Apostles' Creed. Let's recite together. I believe in God, the God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the covenant of sin. <laughs> Let's all pray. Father, I give you thanks for uh, breaking into our reality, breaking into our world, to tell us that you are will, to tell us that you have done something mighty, something that is beyond our explanation in real time and real space. In history, you have come, and you die on the cross for our sins, and you rose from the dead to give us new hope and eternal life. Father, this new reality, may you help us to be reminded and to stand on it, to base our whole life on this foundation, knowing that your kingdom is eternal and your kingdom will come. And we pray that your kingdom will come into our lives. Change us gradually, radically. Transform us into the image of your son. And thank you for the relationship that we have at the foot of the cross. Thank you for saving us and changing our identity. And we are your children. We are your sons and daughters. And may you use us, may you continue to change us into your son's image. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, you're dismissed. Thank you very much. And I want to see you next Sunday and worship God together.